So welcome to Michigan Birding 101. My name's Elliot Nelson, and today we're going to be covering birding basics with y'all. And so I'm really excited. I love this class. Um, I love being able to do it every year. And um, this is one of my favorites because today we're going to cover some of the basics. Um, one of the first objectives we have is, of course, as always, have fun, get your questions answered, and see some cool bird pictures. So at the end of the class, we'll have a Q&A time. It won't be in the recording, um, but if you're here live, you'll get that benefit. Um, also, attendees, um, I'm hoping that by the end of this class, you'll be able to use your binoculars effectively to view birds. One of the most important things is knowing how to use your binoculars. And then uh, one of the other things we'll cover is basic bird field equipment and ID skills. So we'll actually spend some time practicing how do you identify a bird and how do you use that equipment? All right, so let's get started. Well, first off, this class is brought to you by Michigan Sea Grant, um, the organization that I work for. I'm an extension educator with Michigan Sea Grant and Michigan Sea Grant is one of, um, I think the coolest groups that's out there doing work in the Great Lakes region. Our goal is to help foster economic growth and protect Great Lakes coastal resources throughout Michigan. We're actually a joint part partnership between NOAA, the National Ocean Atmospheric Administration, a federal branch of the government, and they provide half our funding and oversight and federal kind of guidance. And then the other half of the program uh, funding comes from the University of Michigan and Michigan State University, who both run the Michigan specific program. Yes, that's right. Green and white and blue and gold working together in one program uh, to help foster uh, the Great Lakes and to care for them. So it's a pretty great organization. We do research, education and outreach in a variety of focus areas. Um, pretty much if it has to do with the Great Lakes, which most things in Michigan do, um, then you're, you know, you're covered through Michigan Sea Grant. Um, so my name specifically uh, is our, my role specifically with Michigan Sea Grant as an extension educator. I'm Elliot Nelson, and I'm based up here in Sault Ste. Marie at the Lake Superior State Center for Freshwater Research and Education. If I peek my head around the corner, I'm glancing over at the Sioux Canada and the Algoma folks over there and the St. Mary's River. Um, I do a lot of aquaculture education, actually, with fish farmers. Um, I also do K-12 uh, aquaculture education and Great Lakes education, coastal tourism, and of course, bird work, because birding is one of my passions. And we also have today Today, joining us, Cindy Hudson. Uh, she's our communicator from East Lansing. She is an integral part of this course. I could not do it without her. You'll see her throughout this um, throughout this uh, course over the next couple of days. Uh, she'll even do a little presentation in one of our uh, later uh, editions. And we could not do what we do without her and our awesome communicators. So uh, we're a group of folks that that fund research, that do education and outreach, do communication, and help improve the Great Lakes. Now, I want to know a little bit about you. We've already heard from quite a few folks that came in, started to share a little bit. I love seeing the stuff rolling in through the chat. Why don't you tell us about your name, uh, where you're from, uh, and the last bird you were able to identify. Um, if you were able to uh, identify a bird, that's great. If not, that's all right. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, if, you're, if you can find that chat feature, and this is a good little practice really quick, Find that chat feature in the bottom and just type out quick your name, what town you're in right now, and maybe the last bird you were able to see if you know, and if not, no worries. Uh, we're here to learn about the birds. And so now we're starting to see some folks roll in. I already know that we've got folks um, from mostly Michigan. We've got some from the UP and Houghton Hot and Hancock. We've also got some folks from Marquette and Battle Creek. Uh, we've got several Lansing folks, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, Boy, we're from all across the state here and other states. I saw Ohio in there, um, a couple folks from Ontario in Canada, uh, Clawson, Michigan, all over the place. So thank you all for joining us tonight. This is really cool to see kind of the broad reach, even somebody joining us from Naples, Florida. That's pretty awesome. Um, so we will be a little Michigan specific, but if you're from the Midwest or even the Eastern part of North America, a lot of these birds will be relative to you. So you can keep filling that out on the chat there. Keep telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, and we're going to start kind of kicking it off with why go birding, right? Why go birding? So why is it that you're here tonight? You probably have your own reasons, but I could think of several reasons why birding is really good for both um, us humans and can be good for the birds too. Um, but one of the first reasons I think everyone should be into birding is because birds are cool. If you know what this bird is, this is a year falcon or year falcon. It's the largest falcon species in the world. It is a, a nice hefty big falcon about the size of a red-tailed hawk or so, maybe a little smaller, but in bulk it's close. And it's a big bird. I've actually watched these birds soar over the eastern UP fields harassing sharp-tailed grouse, like this chicken-sized bird. That's how big they are. But what 
one of the more impressive things besides the agility and the power of this bird is that they nest up in the Arctic tundra on cliff sides. Can you imagine trying to raise your young on the edge of a cliff? Whew, that's a little nuts. And these birds um, are so consistently using these same cliffs that some of their uh, nesting sites uh, have guana that date back 10,000 years almost from the last ice age, more or less. So they they are some of the first birds that have moved uh, into this part of the world after the ice receded. And um, they are just incredible, powerful hunters. But birds aren't just always big and cool. Birds can be little and cool. This is a black pole warbler. And this bird is the size of about, weighs about the weight of two quarters. So imagine two quarters in your hand. And that bird would fit in your hand. And it weighs maybe two quarters or less. Now imagine that bird starting out in Venezuela or Colombia or maybe somewhere else in Central America or South America. Now imagine that bird in the spring flying from Venezuela. It's two pennies or two quarters rather. Two quarters could fit in the palm of your hand. And that bird is going to fly over 20,000 kilometers all the way up to Alaska. And not only is it going to do that on its own power, like miles up in the air at times, it's also going to land in Alaska and immediately start building a nest and raising young. Can you just, like, I cannot fathom that, right? And what's even more crazy is this tiny little creature, this beautiful little neotropical songbird in the fall will pack it all back up or just by that, I mean, fill itself uh, full of fat and food restores up in the Arctic and come all the way back down to Venezuela. I mean, that's insane that it makes that trip twice a year being that small. And that's how incredible birds are with their adaptations. They can do amazing feats. So birds are just really cool. If you don't love birds yet, I hope by the end of this class, you will, you will find a new appreciation for how incredible the adaptations of birds are and what incredible feats they can do. There are many other great reasons to go birding, though, besides just birds are cool. Uh, you know, there's a great sense of discovery and exploration when it comes to birding. Well, I think one of the, my, my favorite things early on in birding was getting to explore the state of Michigan because I was going all over looking for new birds. And that got me exploring and discovering new places. And you can even report your bird sight sightings through different community science programs like eBird or the Great Backyard Bird Count or the um, Kalamazoo Nature Center's Winter Bird Survey. And these uh, actually contribute to science. I just received an email from from Cornell that seven of my sound recordings were used to help make the Merlin Bird app, along with thousands of other people's sound recordings. So it's really cool, the, the exploration you can get in science. Uh, you can also be really into photography. Um, this is another huge aspect for a lot of birders. Uh, it's not my thing. None of these photos you'll see that are mine are going to be good. <laughs> um, but, you know, some people love that. And it's almost like that rare gem hunt, right? It's like a treasure hunt where you're trying to capture that perfect gem of an image like this photo of the snowy owl um, from Paul Rossi. It also could be a fun competition. If you've seen the movie The Big Year, you probably laughed a little bit. I love these actors. They did a great job with this film. Uh, but it captures the spirit of competitive birding. Believe it or not, there's this strong competitive nature, and it's not always national, right? I've competed in the state Big Year uh, competition, which isn't even really a, a formal competition. It's just sort of an informal thing birders do. I've even done county Big Years. Um, you can even do a backyard Big Year and never even leave your house and be involved with some <laughs> really intense competition trying to see the most bird species in your backyard. So there can be a competitive aspect to it. There are also um, lots of uh, times for peaceful and restful experiences. I will talk about in a future class the mental and physical health benefits that birds and birding can actually bring to humans. Uh, but there is an extremely restorative aspect of exposing yourself to nature and being open to your surroundings. Um, and of course, it can also be a really fun social experience. I just had the pleasure of birding the Rio Grande Valley in Texas. And I could not get over how social my first day was. I ran into Tracy, a friend from um, the Muskegon area who winters down there, and she was telling me about where to go see birds. I ran into Cameron Cox and his wife, and they were showing me where the great Colin Beckard was. And there's just a really great community of birders out there. And uh, we'll help you navigate that community in Michigan, learn how to connect with other birders, um, because don't miss out on the social aspect. It's, it's a really important part of birding. So maybe you have other reasons you love birding. Feel free to definitely put those in the chat. Um, but you know, uh, yeah, it, if you, um, sorry, I'm just noticing that a few people are having a hard time hearing me, but I think most people can. Um, so you just have to check your audio features on zoom. Uh, but if you have other reasons that you love birding, uh, definitely feel free to put that in the chat. So, all right, let's head on to, uh, next. 
the next thing, and this is where I want you, if you have them right now, to get out your binoculars. So if you have binoculars, grab your binoculars, and I'm probably going to turn off my virtual background here um, so that you can see a little more about what's going on in my area. <laughs> um, these dwarf lake iris will have to come back later. And so um, I want you to grab your binoculars. And the first thing I want you to do is look for the numbers that are on your binoculars. So this is kind of the starting point where everyone sort of looks at first and thinks about when they're purchasing binoculars. It's the numbers that are on there. So perhaps you uh, might see something like eight by 42 or 10 by 42. Maybe you have 10 by 50s or seven by 32s or 30s. Um, there are many different uh, numbers that you can get, but they all tend to range in the seven to 12 and then uh, kind of the at the low end 25 up to maybe 65 or so with the other number. If you happen to know what that first number is, you can always throw that in the chat. Does anybody know what the first uh, number is? Um, if you know what the first number is, put that in the chat. Think about what might that first number indicate. These are binoculars. They're making something a little bigger. And that first number, that first number actually is the magnification. So it's how many times bigger it's going to make an object. So here we see uh, an eight. That would mean that an object through your binoculars will be eight times bigger than through your, uh, your bare eyes. Same with the 10. That'd be 10 times bigger. Now, that second number is actually maybe even more important. Although the magnification is a really important aspect, the other number is the diameter of the lens in the front here and in millimeters. And it is basically an indicator of how much light is going to be let in. So how much light will be let in to your binoculars. Now, um, you know, these numbers really actually don't move around too much. Uh, whether you buy a $50 pair of binoculars or a $3,000 pair of binoculars, they'll probably standard come in 8 or 10 magnification. Um, so a lot of times what you're paying for with more expensive binoculars is a more clear uh, and clarified vision. Um, so just one thing to consider uh, if you're thinking about purchasing binoculars, you might be thinking like, oh, I really want the 12s or maybe something even like crazy, like boat binoculars that are like 18s or something. Um, but know that more magnification isn't always helpful. Um, you can see here, this is, uh, you know, Monarch, uh, which is from Nikon and their image on an 8 by 10 by 12. It's not a huge difference, but what it does mean is that it takes longer to find the focus, which we'll do in just a minute here. Um, so do think about if you're going to be birding songbirds or in the woods or in kind of shrubby areas, you really might want those eights um, because you're going to be able to focus in on stuff a lot faster because you don't have as wide of a range of focus. Um, tens are kind of what I go for because I like to do a lot of lake bird birding a little bit farther out. Um, I don't see many birders with 12, but you know, that can, that can work too. And sevens can also work. Um, but, you know, really it's fine what works for you. Um, some other things to consider, you know, the eyepiece and comfort level, uh, if you're looking for binoculars, it's really great if you're trying to find a good pair of binoculars to go to a binocular or optic store or like a Bass Pro Shop or Dunham's or something where they have a selection and you can actually put them up against your face because a big part of it is really how they sit against your face, how they feel in your hands, the comfort, the weight, um, and all those things will factor into whether or not those binoculars are right for you. Um, you can also get binoculars with certain coatings like HD or ED, and those can really improve the quality of your binoculars without upping the cost a lot. Um, and you also want to definitely look for waterproof and fogproof binoculars um, if you plan to bird outside at all, uh, which hopefully you do. Um, last but not least, uh, warranties are a big part of binoculars. My um, These Vortex binoculars I have are actually a replacement, a brand new binocular from my Eagle Optics I used to have. And um, that was free because it was part of a lifetime warranty that comes with all Vortex binoculars. And a lot of other brands also come with li lifetime warranties where they'll fix your binoculars for free. Uh, and that can really save you a lot of money in the long run. Um, so those are just some of the things to think about with binoculars. Um, you know, these are, the reason I start with this is because they're really Really kind of the gateway, uh, the gateway to birding, and um, they they really are kind of the essential piece. You can do birding without binoculars, um, but you're really quickly going to find that you want a pair. Now, if you're just starting out, the thirty to one hundred dollar range is often the beginner range. Um, these are going to be probably still to eight or ten by forty twos or fifties or seven by something. Um, but you know that at that price range, you're going to see a lot of darkness um, when you look through. Uh, 
you can kind of see that even on like the uh, monarch images here in the bottom where you kind of get that gray haze around the edge. That gray haze is worse on lower quality glass um, and the image won't be as sharp and crisp. Um, really low end binoculars can even kind of give you a headache because the image is so distorted from the low quality glass. I have this pair of uh, $30 Amazon backup binoculars. And you know what, for 30 bucks, they work. They're 12 by 42s and I can use them and they're a great backup. But if I look through them for too long, I start to get a headache. Um, my Vortex here are in the 250 to $750 range. This is where you can get some really good binoculars at you know that kind of mid-range price there. Um, the Monarchs I have listed there and the Vortex Diamondbacks are both in that price range. And they're, those are not the only companies by any means. They're just the ones I'm familiar with. So definitely look around and shop around. If you're really thinking about getting into this hobby, this is a great price range um, to kind of start aiming towards. You know, save up a little bit for that 250 to 750 range. Once you get over $1,000, you're into the elite binoculars like um, Swarsky or Leica's or other kind of high-end brands. And they are just something else. <laughs> um, I warn you, don't look through one <laughs> unless you're ready to start saving up for one because the image quality is so fantastic that you're quickly going to want to get to there. Um, but of course, you can make anything work. All right. Now, enough about that. Let's start to use our binoculars. So um, I want you to do this along with me. If you have binoculars today, we are going to practice using our binoculars. This is the essential skill to birding. And so let's spend some time using it. First off, I will say even before you raise your binoculars, I want to quickly point out the um, the caps on your binoculars here may be adjustable, okay? So mind lower and raise on mine through a twisting motion. You may have rubber ones that fold down or fold up, um, but a lot of them nowadays have these twists to them. If you have glasses, it's best to twist them down so that your glass on your glasses is directly up against the glass on the binoculars. But if you don't wear glasses, then you want a little bit of relief or space between your eyeball and the glass so your eyeballs and eyelashes aren't running up against the glass and makes it hard to see. Um, so adjust those so that they're appropriate. Um, mine are gonna be up. Yours may need to be down or up. And next, what we're gonna do is I want you to raise them up and look at an object and use the center focus dial here. Use the center dial to get that object in focus. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm gonna raise mine out and I'm gonna adjust that dial until my image goes from blurry to clear. And you can go too far, so you might have to go back the other way, uh, but you wanna look at something until that image is nice and clear. Now, hopefully that's worked out so far for you. I really want you to be doing this. Don't waste this time, let's do this. Um, but you might be seeing two images. So the third thing, you got the eyepiece adjustment, the focus, now you might need to adjust the hinge. That means to go out or down. Everyone's eyes are different space apart. And so what you're gonna be doing is trying to line it up exactly with your two eyeballs so that you get a single clear image. So let's do that again. Let's look at an object, make sure you're in focus and then adjust your hinge so that you're seeing a single clear object. All right, I'm looking at the thermostat and it says 69 degrees, I can deal with that. <laughs> Hopefully you've been able to focus in on something at this point, adjust that, but keep trying, keep working on it. Um, you know, you'll see, you'll, you'll start to realize that, um, you know, once you get that habit down of those three pieces, you can start to get a single clear image um, relatively quick. All right, now, the other thing that uh, a lot of birders don't know about is called the diopter adjustment. Um, so, actually, I think I'm gonna just keep going this way. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a diopter adjustment for our binoculars. Almost every binocular has this, but a lot of birders and binocular users don't realize that it uh, is a feature of their binoculars. I didn't, honestly, for years of birding until one day I was like, oh, what's that? <laughs> and read the instructions on my binoculars and found out. All right, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at an object, and you're going to focus on it. Now I want you to cover up the right barrel and only look through the left and adjust your hinge focus so that you're in focus with just your lit left eye, okay? All right, so mine's in focus with just my left eye covering up the right barrel. Now leave your binoculars set like that and what you're going to do next is you're going to look for your diopter. My diopter here has to be popped up 
But most binoculars, you'll actually be able to twist this to the left and the right. It's a secondary focus that focuses just the right barrel. And so again, you wanna find your diopter, leave this focus. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at this object again with the right, and I'm gonna use my diopter to get it just in focus. Double check with my left, make sure that's in focus. My right is in focus. And now my um, binoculars are adjusted to the differences in the strength between my two eyes. So this will accommodate the fact that my right eye is a little bit stronger than my left eye. And you might be thinking, well, I have corrective lenses or something like that, so I don't really need to do this. I have contacts in right now, and I just adjusted mine about three or four notches to the right, because every day your eyes change a little bit. If you wear contacts for too long, your eyes can get tired. So this is a good skill to get into on a regular basis, to just check your diopter to make sure that that's working out for you. So hopefully for some of you that was new and information that you will be able to use as you go throughout your birding. And then again, that skill of being able to adjust your eyepiece, adjust your focus and adjust your hinge. And then last but not least, adjust the diopter. And those uh, four things will get you ready to start birding. All right, and don't forget, if you have any questions, please make sure to put those in the Q&A section. Uh, we'll be getting to the questions at the end today, uh, but yes, definitely put your questions in the Q&A section. And then uh, if you have any comments or uh, cool things to share, I saw some of you are sharing your binoculars, some of your favorite brands, or some of the, um, some of the war warranties you have, uh, you know, feel free to share that. Uh, there are a lot of different options out there. The Amazon has a bajillion options. Um, so feel free to share, share what works for you. Okay, now let's get to the birding. Okay, time to start birding, everyone. We're gonna do it right now. What I want you to do is take your binoculars and I want you to back up. I want you to back up at least, you know, probably 10 feet from the screen because we're going to find this bird together. And I'm going to teach you some of the ways that you do this. OK, um, now, when you see a bird, you're going to definitely want to look at it with your binoculars. But if you're birding in a wooded se setting or really if you're birding anywhere where the bird is less than, say, 100 yards from you, um, what you want to do first is locate the bird with your eyes without your binoculars. The problem is a lot of birders, when they hear, oh, there's an elegant trogan or some other trogan up there in the tree, you're gonna be like, oh, I wanna see that. And you're immediately gonna raise your binoculars and you're gonna start looking and you're gonna start getting dizzy really fast and nauseous. <laughs> and so you gotta slow down, okay? Um, one of the keys to finding a bird is to really start first by locating that bird with your eyes. And when you see that bird, you'll probably pick up on motion. Um, it's gonna be a lot easier to find that bird without your binoculars first. Again, if it's less than say 50 to 100 yards away. Um, and once you see that bird, you know, pay attention to the features around it. For example, this bird has a big, huge tree right to the right, and it has another branch that's kind of forked right above of it. So when I raise up my binoculars, I know what the context is that I want to look for. I know what's around that bird. And if that bird happens to move, I know, okay, I'm looking at that forked area. I don't see the bird. Maybe it's slightly up or to the left or to the right since I was, uh, it was just there. Um, so again, first step, locate the bird. Second step, see what's around it and keep your eyes on the bird, okay? Now the final step after you've located the bird, you're keeping your eyes on the bird, paying attention to what's around it. You're gonna not take your eyes off the bird and you're simply gonna lift your binoculars so that the bird is hopefully directly in your vision. And I can't back up enough <laughs> to get mine in focus because uh, my office, I'm hitting a wall here. But um, you know, if you're at home, I really want you to practice this. Back up from your screen ways or pick a different object if that works better for you. Um, and keep your eyes on the bird and keep that context in mind and then raise your binoculars and hopefully that bird will be right in your image. This is gonna be a skill that if you can master this, will really help you be uh, have a lot more success at seeing those birds through your binoculars. Again, uh, really resist that temptation to just immediately lift your binoculars and start looking around um, because you're just gonna get dizzy and maybe even nauseous. Uh, so keep your eye on the, locate the bird, keep your eye on the bird, and then raise your binoculars without breaking eye contact with that bird. Keep staring at that bird, keep it in your focus and just simply raise your binoculars up. And hopefully you'll be seeing a bird through your binoculars. 
Okay, well, that is that. And now we're gonna move on to uh, a little bit more about how to identify it. Before we do that, I'm gonna do a quick shout out on two other pieces of equipment you can use, um, but are not necessary. I will say for sure, the most essential piece of birding equipment is a, is a pair of binoculars. You can use sc scopes like my spotting scope here, which is a very low quality, low cost scope. <laughs> um, these are better for really far distances. So like if you're lake watching, again, something more than maybe a hundred yards away, um, you're going to use a, a scope, but they're a lot more expensive. And so um, they're typically a kind of next level up in birding. So most birders don't start out with a scope. Uh, and again, a scope is going to be for more distant birding a lot of the time. Um, that being said, if you are really ready to dive into this and you've got the funds, get yourself a good scope too to go along with your binoculars. And if you do, make sure you invest in a good tripod because a cheap tripod can make a good scope um, kind of less useful because um, a good tripod pod won't shake as much. And then a lot of birders are kind of interested in photography or want to take photos to help them identify birds. Um, some birders do that. Some birders never use binoculars. They just buy really good cameras and use their camera like binoculars. Um, but, you know, cameras like the one here can be tens of thousands of dollars or at least thousands um, to start up. Thankfully, they do make these things like power shots now that are a little bit lower cost. Um, they're more of like a compact lens that you can then extend out like this. And so that could be a, a lower cost startup option. I have this just for documenting birds. I'm not a big photographer. All right, well, that's that on that, but you don't definitely need these. Okay, now it's time to dive into actually birding. So we are going to use our binoculars again, or at least use our, our sight here on the screen, and we're going to um, start birding. Oh, but before that, I do have to talk about field guides. Um, so field guides are sort of the other essential piece of birding equipment. So you've got your binoculars, you know how to use them now. And the next step is to get a book that's gonna help you identify the birds. Um, whatever book you get, a few quick tips. One thing, use the intro section. Most people skip right over that introduction section, uh, but it has a lot of really helpful info. It'll help you learn that a bird is not just a bird, 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 like you see here. A bird actually has many different parts and your field guide is gonna use these terms in the descriptions of the bird. So it's really helpful to reference those um, parts of the birds that are in the intro section. And there can be a lot of other good um, stuff in there. Now, when you're going to choose a field guide, you're going to have a lot of options, um, but here's a few things to think about and my personal preference. So again, your personal preference may be different. Um, first off, bo books are generally either photos or illustrations. Both can be useful. And I actually recommend the Kaufman guide in a second here, which is the photo guide. But for the most part, I think illustrations are a little bit better at emphasizing the right field marks and capturing the, um, the, the posture or the shape or um, structure of a bird. Um, you can get uh, field guides that are specific, like a warbler guide or a raptor guide, or you can get field guides that are just for a whole region um, of all species that are in that region. I would recommend if you're a new birder, starting with a comprehensive guide. Um, maybe you only care about warblers, and so you're just gonna buy a warbler guide, um, but those comprehensive guides are a little better if you're starting out brand new. Um, you can get books that are state specific, regional, like the Eastern US or Eastern North America, or you can get national books like a Canadian bird book or a Mexico bird book or a US bird book. Um, but, you know, generally all, any of those can work, but for a new birder, state and regional guides do kind of reduce the options for you a little bit. So there's that advantage. Um, also, some books have the range maps in the back of the book, where others have them paired with the species description and the pictures. I'm a little bit of a fan of having the range map nested with the bird, like in this National Geographic guide that I have here. I can show you this real quick. Um, this National Geographic guide and many other bird books put the map right there with the um, bird pictures. So you can see the map birds here and the maps over here. The map can help me quickly realize that, oh, I probably didn't see a crested auklet because they're only found in the Bering Strait of Alaska. <laughs> so if I'm in the Great Lakes, I probably didn't see one of those. Rarities do happen, but the maps can help you rule out a lot of birds really quick. Um, and then last but not least, some books uh, I actually come as an app version instead. So you can get apps or physical books as your birding field guide. And really that's personal preference. 
Um, so there are many different guides out there. This is not a comprehensive list nor an endorsement. These are just the ones that I used as a beginning birder uh, and still use today. The Peterson guide is um, the classic, one of the first guides. The Sibley guide is probably the um, what a, what a lot of birders consider the gold standard these days. Um, but you know there are many different guides out there. The National Geographic one I just showed, um, the Golden Guide, the Kaufman Guide is actually a beginning birder book for uh, that's photo based. So it's one of the few that's like that. And if you have a guide you like, feel free to throw that in the chat so we know. Um, this is my Golden Guide. I do like books. Um, this was mine for my kid. I actually got this from my grandparents when I was nine, in 1994 um, when I first started birding, and I like the physical guides because sometimes um, birders like to keep their life list in there. So this bird book means a lot to me because I've written down every species the first time I saw it, the date and maybe some little notes or something. Um, there's squished mosquitoes in my book and it's just filled of memories. Um, so I keep it, um, you know, on my bookshelf at home these days because it's getting a little, <laughs> a little torn. But I did, uh, I do really just encourage you to think about getting a book and really make it your own. There is also an app called the Merlin Bird ID app, and this has really revolutionized birding for a lot of people. It has a great um, set of features for beginning birders, and it's a really useful starting tool. I still recommend getting a field guide. Um, it's gonna be easier to study the birds with the field guide than the app, um, but this app can ask you a set of questions and give you a short list of birds of what you might see. It's called the Bird ID Wizard. And it also has new AI features like um, the sound ID. So you can actually hold your phone up, um, let it hear the bird calls, and it will give you an approximation of what it thinks those bird calls are. It is not 100% accurate. It can often be wrong. So you should just note that. Um, it's always good to double check, maybe listen to some recordings online and see if it's really, or, or the recordings that are in the app to see if they really line up. Um, but it is a really helpful way to learn sound ID. And if you have pictures, you can also upload your pictures to Merlin, and it will use AI to give you an approximation of what it is. Again, neither of these are 100% accurate, but they are so helpful. So um, if you haven't got the Merlin Bird ID app, definitely check it out. And I'm seeing great, um, great, great comments coming through. But yeah, I, I really do love the Sibley guide. The Audubon Society guides can be really helpful too. Those are, uh, those are great. Um, and yeah, I do love that golden guide. All right. So that's the equipment, folks. We talked a little bit so far about why go birding, um, because birds are awesome. And there's a lot of great benefits to birding. We talked a little bit about how to use your equipment. So remember, use your binoculars, learn them, get comfortable with them. Um, you want to adjust the eyepiece, adjust the hinge, adjust the focus, adjust the diopter. And then, um, you know, think about a field book that might be useful for you. And really that's personal preference. Now it's time to start birding, finally. All right, now that we're ready to go birding, and I do want to remind you, if you have any questions on those earlier things, put them in the Q&A section, not the chat. We'll lose them in the chat, but put them in the Q&A. Um, so once you've got your, your equipment down and you're ready to start um, field identifying the birds, um, it's time to use uh, some basic skills. And really I break it down into three steps. The first step is to observe the bird. And you're gonna wanna do this as long as you possibly can. A lot of us have a, a inclination to observe the bird and then quickly grab our bird books and then try to look through our binoculars and our books at the same time back and forth. And it could get really complicated and you can get a little panicky. So my advice is really to set the book down, and observe the bird for as long as it lets you. Um, with most small birds, songbirds, that might not be very long. You may only have five seconds before that bird's gone. You may only get a fleeting half a second glance, but if you spend your time first really observing the bird and taking mental notes, um, then uh, you know, you're gonna really be helping yourself out. After you observe the bird, take some notes or try, try to take some pictures. Write down in your phone or on a piece of paper what it was you saw. And then last but not least, consult your field guide. Um, if, you, you know, if you don't take the notes, it's amazing how quickly our memory fades or can kind of fill in the gaps based on our book that we're looking at. So the note taking can be a really important step. All right, so let's, let's practice this. All right, here we go. 
I want you to start by observing this bird. And I don't want you to tell me what species this is. So nobody put it in the chat. Nobody say the species yet, even if you know. But I want you to start telling me some of the things you notice about this bird. So go ahead, open up the chat, look at this bird. You can even use your binoculars if you want to back up a little bit to observe this bird and start putting what you notice. All right. So we've got our first comment in there. Great. All right. A few more. Red, red crest, red cap that really sticks out there. And long beak. Now, long beak is helpful, but let's think about this in terms of structure, not just relative terms, right? How long is its beak? Well, we don't know. We don't have a ruler, right? But that beak is almost as long as its head, right? So that might be a way that you can use relative size instead of just regular size. So the bill length is as long as the head. Oh, somebody mentioned the habitat. Um, there is snow here. So we're in a colder climate. Um, of course, you'll know that if you're in person, but habitat is really important. We're seeing this bird on fruiting trees here. Um, yeah, size compared to the berries. That's a good relative size comparison, right? Um, now that you have the berries, you may know, okay, that's almost like a crow sized bird there. Um, and then we're kind of comparing it relatively to something. A lot of great comments on the color here, um, but not just color, right? We're looking at pattern as much as color. Um, that red crest in really bad lighting can look black, um, but it's still a crest, right? We see that structure and we, you see that it's darker. Um, and then we see that there are facial stripes that are always going to probably contrast, right? That black stripe goes right up to the beak too. That's a great, so you all are taking a lot of great observations. So when you first see a bird, this is exactly what you wanna do. You wanna be looking at its structure, its pattern, its relative size, its behavior and its location or habitat. Um, and these can all kind of be clues. As you're taking these notes, and if you're out there birding, it's great to have a little right in the rain or real, little notebook ready or an app um, on your phone opened up ready to type some notes in. And that's where you could type these things in if you don't have a Zoom chat to type them in. Um, <coughs> all right, so we have a lot of great, um, a lot of great observations here. So after we've taken our observations, we wrote them down, now it's time to consult our field guide. So we're gonna open up our field guide. And once you have a field guide, it'll be good to kind of start thinking about the categories that are in there. My, um, my National Geographic guide has several categories tabbed on the outside, like hawks, sandpipers, gulls, flycatchers, warblers, sparrows, woodpeckers. Um, so some, some folks are, or, or some field guides are really split up nice and well. And once you kind of have an idea of what those different groups are, you'll be able to get to those groups pretty fast. Um, so many of you probably know what group this bird belongs to with its long bill, but it is the woodpecker group. So this bird is in the woodpecker group. Now this is the woodpecker guide on the Sibley guide, which it's really cool. They have these pages which display all the species at once, and then you can flip to the page for the specific species. So with our observations, which species do we think this is? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Again, we're looking at a book bird that has that crest, that bit of a red crest. We've got those two black facial marks. <clears throat> now the black facial marks, you're right, I saw somebody guess downy woodpecker and those black facial marks look very similar to the downy woodpecker, also the hairy woodpecker. A lot of uh, woodpeckers have black two or three black lines on their face, but only the pileated woodpecker uh, <laughs> and the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is now extinct, um, have a crest uh, in North America. And so this is a pileated woodpecker. Um, so many of you are able to get that with the crest there. Awesome job, folks. Um, great job. You just identified your first bird species, or maybe some of you I know are intermediate or even advanced or backyard birders. Um, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of idea of how the process of identifying a bird works. Now let's try it again. All right, so we got that pileated woodpecker. That wasn't too, that wasn't too hard. Woodpeckers are pretty um, unique looking. Now this one, again, do not say the species. Please nobody say the species yet. Let's start with observations. So what are you noticing about this bird? Um, <laughs> round boy, yes. Uh, this is one of those squishy, uh, very kind of plump looking birds. Um, they have sometimes described as barrel chested um, or uh, barrel bellied. <laughs> um, these also have dark color uh, on, on top 
but then that lighter color on body of the below. So really two tone. Somebody also noticed um, white outer tail feathers. That's a really great observation, Susan. Uh, white outer tail feathers are kind of a unique feature on a lot of birds. Um, a lot of people are saying small bill um, and, and short beak. And again, you know, relative to the head, that bill is much shorter than the head, right? That bill maybe would only, if you flipped it around, reach to the eye. So it's a definitely a short bill compared to its head. And it's a very pale um, pink bill too. We've got some orangish legs there, black feet. Now note that feet and legs are often uh, discolored by mud, but if you get a really good look at them, um, it can be helpful. Um, yeah, no significant patterning here. Great observation, Jerry. This is this is a really um, not heavily patterned bird. It's really just like a two-tone bird with a dark upper and a light under uh, and small dark eye. So <laughs> I love I love Matt's con. Uh, comment there. That's one chonky nugget. It is. That's one of the foofy boys. Um, so this kind of um, these kind of observations actually really can help us, even those kind of silly ones, um, because it kind of gets us into this idea of this general structure here. These kind of squat short birds. Now, if, if anybody knows this group of birds, um, a lot of times they are more brown and streaky, and we call them uh, the little brown birds, because this is actually a bird in the sparrow family. So this is what the sparrows look like in the Sibley Guide. This is all the sparrows in North America, so there's a lot more than you would just see in, in Michigan. Um, but now we can start, now that we've got those observations, let's take a look on this um, field guide here and see what could possibly kind of fall into this. Well, we're not looking at the brown streaky folks, right? Um, we're looking for those more two-toned kind of birds. Here's a black chin sparrow that kind of matches some things. We've got a couple species of juncos that might match up here. Maybe this five-striped sparrow um, and maybe some of the towhees. Um, but we're kind of seeing that the towhees don't quite have that two-tone except for the Eastern towhee, which if you get into the range maps is the only one that would be in Michigan regularly. Um, and so a lot of you are starting to make some guesses already, um, which is pretty good because uh, they're right. <laughs> uh, so we're not looking at a black chin sparrow because it doesn't have that two-toned or the brown. And the five-stripe sparrow has too many um, facial markings. So that really gets us down to the dark-eyed junco, but you might be looking at that saying, well, that doesn't quite look right. Maybe the yellow-eyed junco. Um, but once you open up to the uh, specific species, then you'll start to notice that there are often more than one single um, way that a bird can look. In fact, most birds have multiple plumages. So this is the dark-eyed junco, and it's a bit of a challenge one uh, because they come in many varieties. But you'll notice that only the slate-colored variety uh, which is sort of our local subspecies, is what we would find in Michigan. And you can see that some of them have our adult males that have this uh, two-toned color like we're seeing here, whereas the females can have more of those brown tones. Um, but yeah, those of you that guessed, great job. You got another one right. This is a dark-eyed junco. And again, this one, just to point out that birds might not look exactly the way you see them, um, in your book, but once you get into the species specific part, you'll see the different color variations. All right, way to go, folks. You are, are just knocking this out here. Uh, you're doing a great job and hopefully you're finding these skills useful. All right, let's, we're gonna do, I think one more here. Let's do one more. Again, do not say the species, please. Hold off on saying the species until I ask for you to. Um, but let's start with some observations. Um, again, this is another good example of a bird that comes in a couple of different plumages. Um, and so let's, let's give it some guesses as to what are some of the observations here. Um, so first off, some folks say aquatic and diving. Um, you know, maybe this, maybe if you were actually watching this, you'd watch this bird dive underneath the water. Um, in the water, uh, somebody guessed female, but that may or may not be right. We'll look at this bird in a second. Um, Somebody else guessed winter plumage, so I'm guessing you're not a beginning birder. <laughs> um, you may know that there are actually different plumages. This is the winter plumage. Uh, but some of our observations that are coming in are white bill or light colored bill and slightly longer than a head, right? It's a really long, uh, long headed or long headed bird and a long billed bird. Um, it has a dark eye, which is good. It kind of has a brown upper um, and it has a white chest and up front part of the neck, right? So we've got this kind of two tone look with sort of like a fuzzy border in between. Um, and we're seeing it that it's wet, right? We're seeing that it's in the water. Um, so that's some good um, 
some good habitat comments here. Um, white underside is another interesting guess. And a few folks are guessing that this is a waterfall bird, like a duck or loon or something like that. Um, and so if you start to open up, now that we've kind of got, yeah, short tail, that's a, that's a good one too, or, or at least a tail that's below the water. And then head shape, Terry, that's a really important one. So this bird has a little bit of a lift right before and then a pretty flat head. Head shape is super important for waterfowl. Um, curved heads or where the peak of the head is, if it's in front of the eye or behind the eye, those are all really important. So I would describe this bird as having a flat head with the peak of the head being in front of the eye close to the bill. And that's a really helpful thing to write down in your notes. All right, so those of you that are kind of guessing waterfowl, if you open up your book to waterfowl, you'll see that we have kind of ducks, grebes and loons as and geese and swans. I guess there's five different main groups. So you probably know this isn't a goose or a swan. It doesn't have as long as a neck. It could be a duck, a grebe, or a loon. But if you open up your book, you'll see that the loons and grebes are kind of the ones that are going to have these long, narrow bills. Um, now, if we're looking at this list here, now it's time to take your guess as to what species you might think we're seeing here. Um, and so this is a little tricky of one um, because there are some very similar looking loons here, um, but which of the species of loons do we have here? Well, if we're looking at the red-throated loon, we see that that has a pretty well-defined border of white and that white goes all the way up above the eye. So it's probably not the red-throated loon. It also has a checkered back. Um, the Pacific loon and the Arctic loon have a much more arched um, back of their neck. And again, a really clearly defined line between the white and the dark. Um, also probably not expected around here. So that leaves us these two species. And although the yellow bull loon looks similar, it is not quite a yellow bill, is it? It's more of a pale whitish grayish bill. Um, and the other thing too that we're kind of noticing um, is that well, if you flip to your bird book, part of these two species, you'll see that the range map for these two species does not overlap very much. And what we would expect to see in Michigan would be the common loon, which is what a lot of you have already guessed. Uh, and the common loon is the correct answer, or the great northern diver is another name for this bird, which I, I think is an awesome name. I wish that's what we called them. Um, but anyway, uh, the common loon is uh, comes in many color varieties. As you can see, if this bird was in the breeding plumage, you probably would have known what it was immediately. But because this bird is in its winter plumage or non-breeding plumage, and this may be a juvenile bird even, or a first year bird, um, it, it is a little bit trickier. So great job though, folks. You are really getting these um, skills of identifying down really well. Um, and, and, and I really encourage you to just keep practicing those, those um, that, that routine. Observe the bird and really look at structure, pattern, and relative size. Take notes or pictures and then consult your field guides. If you can remember those three steps and really get detailed with your observations, um, you're gonna become an awesome birder before you know it. All right, um, some common pitfalls. One of the things, a lot of folks were throwing out colors and we, Colors can be very helpful, but colors can look very different depending on the lighting or maybe if a bird is dirty or something. Um, so let's try not to over rely on color. Think about looking at patterns as much as colors because patterns are often more visible even in bad lighting. Um, size, you know, we talked about size a little bit. If you're just saying it's big or small, that is completely relative. So, you know, Either comparing it to a nearby object or comparing it to itself is really the best comparison. You can say its tail is as long as its body. That would be a very long-tailed bird. Um, its legs extend beyond the tail. Its beak may be the length of its head or half the length of its head or a quarter the length of its head. Um, and then the last one, remember expectations and memory can really alter our ideas of stuff. Our memories fade really quick and we can jump to conclusions where our brain actually fills in the gaps of something we didn't see. So writing down notes can really help alleviate this. Last but not least, 
it's okay not to ID every bird. That's why I put this picture of gulls up here where there's probably two or three species in there. Um, but, you know, it's okay not to ID every bird. You're new, if you're a new birder or even if you're an advanced birder, I've been birding for a long time and I definitely just have to let some birds go. Enjoy seeing them and be like, I just don't know what it is. That's okay. You don't have to ID every bird. You may just become a birder who just likes seeing birds and doesn't ID them at all. And that's okay because this hobby is really about having fun and enjoying what's out there. Ah, all right. So I'm just review the chat here real quick, but we're getting down to the last 10 minutes. Zach points out a good, good note too, as you build your skills up more, you can start to uh, learn the different plumages. Although there's nothing wrong with learning the, the kind of most obvious male plumage first. They're normally the birds with the brighter colors. Females are often more drab. So they can be more camouflaged on, on when on nest. Um, but yeah, it's it. There are multiple um, colors and different types of birds, uh, even within a species. So that's good to start learning that, and that's where a field guide becomes really handy. All right. Well, again, I see some questions are starting to come in. In about ten minutes, we're going to get to our Q and A time. So definitely keep putting those questions into the Q and A section. I, I'm very much looking forward to answering some of those. But I wanted to leave you with some resources because I said birding could be very social, and also the one of the best ways to learn how to bird is to go birding with somebody else. Um, and in fact, this is a good time to plug. Um, if you attend the last class, I'm going to be announcing some in-person birding trips across the state. Um, so make sure you stick around to the last class and we'll, um, we'll be announcing that at the end. But um, there are other ways to get connected to birders and birding and to bird your skill, build your skills. One of those is to join a Facebook group. Um, there are many Facebook groups that are dedicated to birding. And one of the best ones I think that's out there or, or one of the more helpful ones is the group what's this bird and this is where if you have a picture of a bird or a really detailed description you can go put it on that website and a lot of birders will start looking at it and give you some guesses um, there are great photo sharing groups and just kind of general bird loving groups like birding michigan or michigan bird watching there are county and regional groups like i'm i'm one of the moderators for the up birding group there's an algoma district birding group for those of you across the river here in canada there's a blue water audubon group there's a grand Grand Rapids Area Birders Club. There's all, all sorts of different regional groups. And then there are groups on Facebook for rare birds. One of the other new things we have is uh, a new technology. Well, it's been around a long a while, but new for birders in that we've been adopting something called a Discord server. And this is a chat messaging application. You can use it on a computer or a phone. Um, you can do it through a downloaded app or just through a browser. And the Michigan Birding Discord has now, I think, upwards of like 5,000 people on it. And it's really becoming active. It has different channels for every part of the state. It has rare bird channels. It has chat channels. It has a women birders part. It has a Great Lakes birder. It's got all all sorts of great resources. We'll be sharing the link to this Discord server. Do know that it's a bit of a learning curve. You'll have to learn to use that technology. But if you're up for that task, um, it's a really great community. And it's 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 a little more intimate in that it has all these different regional channels. It's a great way to meet birders in your area. Um, and then last but not least, the website, All About Birds, which is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, who also makes the Merlin app, is a great website. It actually serves as a field guide. I use it all the time as a reference because it has great info about about birds and um, they also have birding classes on there, um, birding quizzes and other a ton of other great resources. So um, definitely shout out to that. Now, if the internet's not your thing, or if you're just looking to meet up in person, check out your local clubs and nonprofits that are interested in birds. So Michigan Audubon is our st uh, a statewide Audubon group. Um, they have a variety of events around the state and uh, um, a great newsletter that's an awesome magazine. So definitely encourage you to check out Michigan Audubon. Um, My Birds is a new initiative from the DNR and Great Lakes Area Audubon. Um, there's a whole uh, Facebook page and um, Aaron, who runs the My Birds program, does field trips around the state. Um, the American Birding Association is a more national focus group, although we do have one of the ABA's um, employees based here, John Larry in Michigan. Uh, but they're, they also do more national kind of events. Um, and then there are regional Michigan Audubon chapters and regional Great Lakes and national Audubon chapters like the Grand Rapids Audubon Club, the Sioux Naturalists, which is a binational group up here in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, the Laughing Whitefish Bird Alliance over in Marquette, um, Detroit Bird Alliance, or 
I'm not sure what their name is now. Maybe it's still Detroit Audubon. Um, and so there are a lot of different smaller regional groups. We'll send you, again, a, a follow-up email, ways to connect with these groups. Um, definitely check them out. And also check out your local library or if you're near a university. Many universities have birding clubs like MSU does and the University of Michigan does, um, Lake Superior State University. So if you're a college student or a faculty or even if you're just a local community member, they'll often let you join in. All right, so that's a few of the resources. Thanks to Navigate. I definitely encourage you to get connected to your local Audubon or your local bird club. I definitely encourage you to check out the Michigan Bird Discord server. It's really worth learning that technology just to be a part of that group. And it's really not that confusing once you get used to it. Um, but you know, find those resources in your own backyard, get those binoculars out, get out there this week and start practicing with those skills, start getting connected and start learning how to just appreciate and, and uh, learn from this amazing resource we have in our state of Michigan, which are our birds.